dowry. It's a big subject. You can make, like you, you saw me pass through my notes. It's a big subject on its own. But let me say three things. I want Felix to read for me the book of um, the book of First Corinthians, chapter seven. First Corinthians, chapter seven, verse thirty-nine. As he is reading it, let me tell you three things. Number one, that um, the Bible tells us the way we have seen Old Testament marriages is not biblical. He says in Matthew chapter 19, it was not like that from the beginning. In other words, if you want to know true marriage, we go back to Genesis. We don't follow David's marriage, you don't follow Abraham's type of marriage, we go back to Adam and Eve. That's what is the biblical marriage. We cannot copy the Old Testament examples. They have polygamy, and the Bible did not support polygamy. If the Bible had supported polygamy, there were enough ribs, you know. When he removed one rib and made Eve, he would have removed another rib, and, and uh, instead of making Eve, now make, uh, make a, a, a Ed or so whatever else. Now, so it's important to understand that as the first thing, that a lot of our traditional marriage customs are similar to the Old Testament ones. But, you know, it's very clear that Jesus dismissed them and he says we were not supposed to copy that system. Number two, I want you to understand that one of the best examples of marriages we have is of, of, of Isaac. You know, Isaac is one who never even became polygamous. They married Rebecca and said the two of them never got involved with any other woman. But you know, she, she was not, no dowry was paid for her. You follow, you follow Eliezer going to, go, going to look for a bride for Isaac. Why is he going such a long journey? Because the, mother, the wife had to be a believer in Jehovah. One lesson. Number two. You know the story, and I don't have enough time to deal with it. When he reaches, he actually, he actually um, um, does a process that finally leads him into the home of, the, of, uh, of Rebecca's father. He tells the story. Rebecca's parents say, ah, this is of the Lord. You can have her for Isaac. The moment he now is assured he has a wife for Isaac, he goes outside and brings gifts. And he starts giving gifts to everyone. That's not dowry. Because dowry is not something given as a gift. It's something demanded by the, by, the, by the parents of the girl. In other words, you don't give dowry the way you want. Dowry is given the way the... Because they are selling the girl. The other word for dowry is bride price. Even among our custom. In Kikuyu we say, I bought a wife. The, in Kikuyu, they don't beat about the bush. They state it clearly. Dowry is buying a wife. But in, we, see, we see our Old Testament example where it was not involved. It is true, Laban, who was a crook, sold his daughters. He sold, he sold two daughters to Jacob. Again, you, have, you are learning that, that, is not, that the Bible is not giving you an example to follow. So you need to understand clearly if you go to the Old Testament, there's there no requirement for you to pay dowry because we can see examples where dowry was not paid. But that's very interesting that most in the dowry negotiations, people quote Isaac, yet there is no dowry in Isaac's example. I want you to go and read Genesis chapter 24 for yourself. But now, my third point, go to the New Testament. There's a lot of discussions on, uh, there's a lot of discussions on marriage in the Gospels, in the letters of Paul, in the letters of Peter, or the, even the book of Revelation, talks about marriage, but never about dowry. Somewhere in the New Testament, when Jesus said things were not like that, they stopped copying the dowry, the polygamy, they all stopped at that point. So the New Testament does not have polygamy, does not have dowry. So if you actually want to continue with the dowry, you would have to find another source rather than the New Testament, is an example of that. However, may I say right here, the scriptures are clear about generosity. 
we are supposed to be generous as Christians. So if you are a young man and you are seeking the hand of marriage of your girlfriend from her parents, surely don't go empty-handed. It's not Christian at all. Go carrying the gift. And gift is not dowry. The gift may be bigger than, much bigger than the dowry they were going to ask. But it is your choice is a gift to the parents of the girl. So any man here who has daughters, ask yourself which scripture you'd use to ever serve your daughter. You can use your treasure beliefs, but if you're a Christian, there is literally no basis to ever sell your daughter. But now, let's hear Felix reading verse 29, verse 39. First Corinthians 7, 39. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. You know, that completely destroyed dowry. Because dowry is a clan buying a wife. The moment you are bought, whichever tribe you come from, the moment you have been bought, if your husband dies, you are inherited by his brothers. You do not, a non-new dowry is paid, because you already paid, you already belong to them. And it was true of the Old Testament. Even in the Old Testament, it was exactly like that. When your, husband, when your husband died, you are taken over by his brothers. But then Paul comes and destroys the whole basis of dowry. He says, no. In a Christian marriage, if your husband dies, you don't, be, you don't marry his brothers. There's no question of dowry that you are bought. You are free to marry anyone. The only condition is, if you truly are a Christian woman or a Christian man, whoever you are marrying after the death of your spouse must belong to the Lord. He must be born again. Can you imagine, my, my friend, if you have a daughter and you sell her, as soon as they pay you, not a gift but dowry, your daughter now belongs to that clan. If her husband, and we pray she, he doesn't, but in case he dies, traditionally those people have a right to demand they take her over. Is that what you want for your daughter? If that's not what you want for your daughter, why are you not accepting a gift rather than demanding dowry? I think that's, um, that, that, that's what I want to say about the issue of dowry. So, there is nothing wrong with exchanging gifts. There is even Christian, Christianity in exchanging gifts. But there is something wrong about selling. There is no biblical basis in the New Testament for selling and taking dowry. Number two, buy your right. I want Felix, my assistant. Felix has become my 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 communication assistant to read for me Deuteronomy chapter eighteen, Deuteronomy chapter eighteen, verse ten, eleven, and twelve. Deuteronomy chapter eighteen. But we are not talking about buy your right. And unfortunately, the person who asked about buy your right. It's difficult because they are not the same. But let me give you an example I saw the other day. I was in Ikikuland, and the pastor oh, stopped the barrio midway. Say, hey, don't do that. Don't. I said, what is it? No, no, no. That's, the coffin is facing the wrong direction. You know the head, when you are burying the owner of the home, the head has to face the gate. <laughs> now, you know the scriptures are totally different. They say, soil back to the soil. And even if your head is facing the right direction, after the ants have eaten you up, the soil will not, you will not know that. <laughs> you will not know the direction that the head was facing after a few years of the soil working, of the ants working on you. What a nonsensical thing. And now it was the pastor saying, that's why I told you syncretism is so real, it's unbelievable. This is a pastor himself teaching something that is not Scripture, and because there are two problems among the Kikuyus. Kikuyus were not burying. Even by the time I am born in the 1950s, burial was a very new thing. When a Kikuyu died, we put him in a gunia and tried to dig a hole. Burial, burial ceremonies among Kikuyus is not something traditional. Number two, it's not Christian. The Bible says to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. That means 
The moment Nganga spirit leaves, what you are seeing is not Nganga. It is the remains of Nganga. It's the body of Nganga. Nganga is not variable. You can only bury his body. If you are a Christian, you cannot be buried. That's why in Christian funerals, we don't address ourselves to the dead. Because you see, you are burying the guy one week later or three weeks later. He left. The moment he died, he left. So the body, what you do with the body, like if I died and you refused to bury me, I was just mad on you. It, it does not affect barriers, do not affect the dead person at all. He is safe in the Lord's hands. What you do, whether you bury with a coffin or in a gunia, with a, with a sack, it affects, it doesn't affect. Barrio is something about us. Why do we bury? Why does the church do barrio? For the sake of the living. You are what they call in psychology closure. You want the people to now know that their loved one is not available. That's why you make sure you take the body somewhere. I've seen a, a question about uh, cremation. It really doesn't matter as long as soil goes back to the soil. It can be cremation, it can be burial, it can be anything. There is nothing in the scriptures. You know, some of the people cannot be buried because they were eaten by crocodiles in the sea. When the trumpet sounds, the Bible tells us, wherever you are buried or not buried, the Spirit of the Lord at the sound of the trumpet, you, the dead will rise up in Christ. And we who are alive will be translated to meet the Lord in the air. So it's very important to understand barriers for Christians are about the living, not about the dead. You know, I really, since I know we don't have enough time, I really would suggest you take my book. I've written a new book on this topic called Christianity and Culture. It's available in the Scripture Union Bookshop. And there's a chapter on death. I would like you to look at it so that you can continue. But... Let us uh, now read Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse, verse 9, 10, 11, and 12. 10, 11. Of course, it says, Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire. Those are now traditions of the Canaanites that the Jews were not to follow. The first one is, is killing a child in the fire. Yes. Number two. Yes. Who practices divination or now divination is in Africa. The Luos do it. The Luyas do it. They all have a kind of a man of a man of God, a traditional man of God, who tells them what the tribe should do. It's called divination. It tells you why you are sick is because your uncle in the grave is unhappy with you. They were told never talk to God. Don't talk to Mondomogo to diviners. Number three, who practices uh, or interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or cast spells. Oh, now, those are all to do with reading stars and things in order to know about the future, seeking to be guided by, by other than Jehovah himself. And finally, or who cast spells or who is a medium or spiritist or who consults the dead. Yeah. Anyone who does now, just up to there. Just up to there, who consults the dead. The scriptures are clear. The dead must be allowed to die. As soon as Nanga is dead, if you see my dream, please understand that's some demonic visitation. The scriptures are clear. The dead and the living are not supposed to relate in any way. I mean, Lazarus was told. You know, the, the dead man and Lazarus, if you know the story in the, in the, in the, in the Bible, Jesus said um, the, the, in the story that uh, they were told there's no way those who are dead can talk to the living. They have Moses and the prophets. In other words, they have the Bible. Let them rely on the Bible. So the scriptures make it clear. The dead and the living do not communicate in any way. That's why it's literally a biblical misnomer for anybody to write in the newspaper. You know, you know, you are loved, you loved you, you loved it. You, know, you are addressing yourself to the dead. The living are not supposed to address themselves to the dead in any way. In other words, in funerals, we don't talk to the dead. We talk about the dead. We celebrate what they did when they are alive. But now we don't talk to them. And so you do not consult the dead. You don't deal with the dead. I hope 
I have said enough about burial rights. So whatever it is you do with the burial, it must simply be about encouraging the, the living, about literally burying or disposing of the remains of the dead so that the, the living can get a closure. But don't refer to it or act as if there's a religious value in the body itself. The final one is about child wearing, child naming. Again, any child naming that has no religious connotation has no problem. You know, like now people like being called Brian. I don't know why Brian has become very common. And it's not, there's no African called Brian. It's, they are getting it from Google. Now, I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand that custom of young people, you know, go Googling names. But I, I don't have a biblical basis to tell you Brian is a bad name. Or Natasha or some funny name which they are getting from novels. And that, that naming is the name you prefer. Again, if you name your parents and there has no religious connotation, you are not trying to get the spirit of your, of your parents in your child. There is absolutely no biblical reason why you cannot name your child children. However, if you name them with some belief system, obviously there will be something wrong. So you cannot condemn the naming until you understand what it is based on. So if, for example, I name my mother, and I think the spirit of my mother has entered my daughter, and I start treating my daughter like she is my mother-in-law, my friend, then it's dangerous to name your child daughter like that. But I'm one person who believes that the best example of how useless a name is is a, is a guy called Jabez. Jabez's name means pain. What a terrible name for a mother to call her child. But when Jabez became an adult and was able to talk to God, Jabez talked, talked to God and told God that he wanted to be blessed. What did God do? He never changed his name. Still continued to be called Bain. He expanded his territory, a territory and he blessed him indeed. So your name cannot stop your blessing. You would have to look for where in the Bible that is. A few people in the Bible, their names got changed. But they are in a minority. The majority retain their old name. And God used them. Peter was, was, was called Simon. Was named to Peter. But Andrew remained. His brother remained Andrew. So P, not, not naming, changing names. Because you become a Christian. Has no biblical basis. However, since like I'm saying the names are not the issue. If you want to change your name is okay. But don't start thinking that you are, you'll be more blessed. Because you used to be called karaoke, and because karaoke has something to do with resurrection from the dead, that you now change your name because you are called karaoke. God cannot be prevented from blessing you because of your name. So do not give more meaning to names than it is there. However, if your naming system is about the spirit, like for example, some of the people wait until the baby cries, they call the baby this, call baby this, then the, the one that will make the baby keep quiet. It's the one in the, the, it's the spirit that the baby has. Now, that kind of a custom, you can't continue and say there's no belief system because it's already showing you there's a belief system. May the Lord truly help you. Now, unfortunately, our time is gone and I would like, I've wanted to cover one or more examples. So, 40 minutes are just five minutes away. Let me return the meeting back to Felix. One question asked three in three ways. Uh, then I'll ask uh, Celine to her hand is up. So Celine, please. What's your question? Uh, my question is, is more of a, not really a question, but what I'm gathering is that the, it matters what the deeds. Uh, if the deeds have a belief behind it. Uh, that's what we should be careful about uh, in regards to also because we may be evoking certain altars in our lives and altars speak. Now, you, if I understood, uh, Celine, uh, Celine, you are 100% correct. You heard me correctly. That if it is simply a custom, there's nothing wrong with it. But what is the belief behind the custom? The belief behind the custom is what you will stop. So that means. Some people will be doing something innocently. They, those can continue. Others do something with a belief behind it. Those ones must stop. 
So Celine, you understood me thoroughly. So that's why for every custom you ask yourself, what is the belief behind this custom? Or is there no belief? For example, Kikuyus eat mukimo, some funny mixture of all kinds of things mashed together. But you'll never hear Kiku telling you that you'll be blessed for eating, kuku, for eating mukimo. They can tell you it is nutritious, but it has nothing to do with the blessings. So you can eat mukimo knowing that it's not a religious, one of, one of those religious uh, belief systems. So Celine, you're 100% right. In line with Celine's question, there's also three more. How does one distinguish between traditional religion and culture? Then the other one is... Uh, uh, and then Jira's question, which was around. Uh, I think mine has been answered. Okay, just to respond to that. It is more or less the same. Traditional. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think basically the question is simply one I covered earlier, but I can repeat myself. That I'm saying traditions are okay, but religion is not. Religion is any custom that has spiritual consequences. In other words, if you don't do it, you lose a blessing. If you don't do it, you might get a curse. If you do it, you will get a blessing. No, 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 no. That, that, that is now religion. Customs don't bring blessings or curses. So, the moment you enter into that, number two, tradition in a custom that has no, tradition in a custom that has, uh, or rather, a pure custom, a pure tradition is in a custom that has no consequence. Hence, you do it by choice. No, nobody in your tribe will tell you, hey, hey, don't do that. No, it's okay. You can choose what to do or not. That is simply a custom. Religion is any custom where if you say yes to the following, does a custom bring blessing? Then it's religion. Does a custom bring a curse? Then that is religion. Does a custom provide protection from spiritual harm? That is, that is religion. You know, you need to classify what is religion and not very, 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 very carefully. Because the traditional custom that we are saying is okay to keep a preferred way for the group or the clan or the tribe to do things. Just a preferred way. In other words, they don't criticize the others who do it differently. But we, this is what we prefer doing. So ask yourself, is it in line with the scriptures? Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 5 is saying, in the last days, we no longer follow our traditions. We follow the Son. We follow the Word of God. Next, check if it involves blood. Next, ask if not, being, if not doing it has bad mysterious consequences. Ask if not doing it is whatever. Subscribe to our being, does it subscribe to our being Christian first? If it's telling you that your tradition matter more than Christianity, then there's something wrong with that custom. In everything, therefore, the question to ask is, how does the particular thing or custom serve and glorify my master? Does it honor God? If the answer is no, you must stop that custom. Does it deny Christ? If the answer is yes, you must stop that custom. I hope I've answered the question. Yes, yes. And the final one, which is also closely around, are most cultic churches emanating from merging Christianity and traditional religion? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. Because um, the reason we call them cultic is because they take something in the Bible, then they take something outside the Bible and practice. That's what we are being, we, because they still call themselves Christians, but they are actually cultic. So the answer is yes. <laughs> 